everybody. I am still Denise Augusto. I am still in my dining room and I still welcome you to our, our webinar today. Um, this is one of our monthly webinars for the program in the Masters of, Info Masters of Science and in Information at Drexel University's College of Computing and Informatics, where I am a professor and also the director of our Library and Information Science program. For our webinar this month, I thought we would talk about the capstone requirement, what it means, particularly within the library and information science major within the Masters of Science and Information degree program. So I invited and kind of coerced five of our current and past students to talk about different capstone projects that they've had. They've worked in all kinds of different organizations, so I thought it would be fun to have them each talk casually for about five minutes about their projects to tell us a little bit about what they did um, with the idea of enabling others to see different potential projects and the large range of projects that we have. So let's see, our presenters are... I can't remember the order because I had it on the slide. Oh, let's see, Stefan, if he wants to go first um, after an introduction. Stefan worked in the Drexel University archives, did some really interesting stuff, especially to those of you who love archives. Then we have Lucy Wang, who um, worked in first an online library and then switched to a public library. Then uh, Jane Lipman, I saw her somewhere, there she is. Jane is currently working on her capstone with the Metadata Research Center. I know some people get terribly excited if you even say the word metadata, so we'll be interested to hear what she has to say. Um, Brittany Coleman, there she is. Brittany um, also worked in a public library, and she'll tell us about what she did. And lastly, we have Albert Lynn, who worked at an academic library in chemistry. So for those of you who don't know about the capstone, it is a required part of our MSI, Masters of Science in Information. We first started requiring the capstone as a part of our library and information science degree in 2017. Uh, and we started the capstone because employers and alumni from our program were telling us that they, they loved the program and the curriculum, but they felt something was missing, a practical component that would give students the chance, ooh, give students the chance to get some, Mike will be joining in a moment to fix the screen issue. Thank you. Um, the, we began the, pro, the capstone program in 2017 as a way to give students some practical work experience in their area of interest, whatever that happens to be. The host now. I have been upgraded to host. Now you get to see a picture of my kids. And now, there. All right. So this again is the list of our five students who volunteered or were coerced today into speaking. Thank you again to the five of you. And before we hear from the students, I was giving you a little bit of background on the capstone requirements. As I said, it started in 2017 in the library and information science degree. And we created the capstone project to enable students to gain work experience in their desired field of work before they graduate. It's very important to us that students determine on their own what their desired field of work is. We have many students who are interested in work in libraries, many who are interested in work in research companies, pharmaceutical companies, corporations, government agencies, museums, archives, um, many different organizations, as many as you can think. Uh, just checking out the chat here for a minute. All right, um, we started the capstone, as I said, in 2017. At the time, we started it for one quarter, which is 10 weeks long at Drexel. Students worked 10 works per 10 hours per week for the period of 10 weeks for one quarter. And we went along that way for about two years. It was very successful, but students and employers asked us if we could extend the project and make it longer. So starting in fall of 2019, we extend the capstone to two quarters, which is about 10 hours of work per week for a total of 20 weeks. 
when the project is done near the end of student's degree program. Again, students get to choose the kind of organization with which they want to work. And we have all different kinds of organizations. I've had students work in nursing homes, um, students work in insurance companies, uh, law firms, just about anything you can think of. And students can find and create their own projects or they can select from a list of available projects that we have from interested employers who contact us asking for students. The capstone is really pretty open-ended. We are very interested in creating projects and helping students create projects that are meaningful to them. But students need to decide for themselves what is meaningful. And that's where our students come in. So are you guys ready to tell us about your projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. OK, Stefan, can, would you like to start talking? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so I completed my capstone project um, the past fall quarter. So that was back when it was still one quarter for the entire project. So I was working at the Drexel University archives from about um, the end of September to mid to late December. And um, I first contacted them back in June. And um, as in the beginning, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do for my capstone project. But I was inter more interested in um, archives and like specifically digital archival work. So when I got an email from Professor Gusto talking about how the archives were willing to work with students if they wanted to do a project there, um, I contacted them. Then we spent the summers exchanging emails um, back and forth, uh, coming up with a plan that works for both of us. And um, so starting in September, um, I began working on a digitization project for the archives. And basically, I was working with um, two uh, particular types of material. One was a collection of about 130 photos um, all about members of the um, Drexel family. And the other was a course catalog from, I believe it was 1924 to 1925. And um, I would scan both materials um, all of it onto the computer. Then once I was complete, when, once I completed the scanning process, I would um, do like touch up the photos and perform quality control and, um, and uh, I believe it was called GIMP. Um, it's a photo um, editing software. And basically what I would be doing for that is I would, um, I would be correcting the color so that it looked exactly like it would if you were looking at it in person. And if the um, if I didn't scan them exactly straight, I could use the software to um, to straighten the photos um, neatly. And once I was done with that, I would work on um, the metadata. And for the photos, the metadata was actually the bulk of the project because metadata is such an extensive process. So um, I would have to um, transcribe handwriting on the backs of photos. Um, I would have to, for some of them, research the context of the photos. And one thing I was particularly proud of was um, I saw a, a car in the uh, background of one of the photos and by researching the model of that car, I was able to find like approximate date that this had to take place after. And um, uh, I also, I spent a lot of time looking at, um, at uh, subject heading um, because everything has to be standardized. And that took a lot of time because like sometimes you would find a subject heading that you would think would fit with the um, photo, but I would go and ask the digital archivist for um, a second opinion. And she would inform me that that subject heading is actually really specific and it, 
it's for the specific type of photo in a specific type of book and I can't use that for like the photo I wanted to. So I, I would have to look again for a more general type of subject heading. But um, yeah, that took a long time. And, but once I was done with that, it was time to upload everything to the Idea Online repository. And once you fin, <clears throat> and um, for the uh, different materials I used, we had different ways of uploading them, but it was mostly so I became familiar with the different ways. Um, one way which we use for the photos is um, we created a spreadsheet of all the metadata, and then we um, inputted all of that data like directly into the um, into the um, repository alongside the photos. But in the other way was um, for the course catalog. I scanned all of the um, all of the pages and put them together as a sort of book. So compared to the photos, it was really just one entry. And then, um, like I would ent manually enter the um, metadata while putting while adding the um, the images to the repository, rather than creating the metadata in advance for each individual photo, like I did for the others. And um, that was it. And in addition to that, they also made time to um, kind of help broaden the experience for me. And because um, I expressed like concerns about like other things that I wanted to learn or wanted to gain a little experience with. So they walked me through the process of researching um, reference questions and how one, like how far one should research before deciding like it's not something that they can do at the archives and you might have to reference them to a different um, facility. But um, then they also taught me how to um, pull information or data from um, CDs and uh, do a virus check and upload those to the repository. And um, I was also allowed to sit in on presentations that they gave for students from various classes that came in. So that was really helpful. And um, overall, I think I it was a really valuable experience because in class you get a lot of um, conceptual information and like having the experience working with the material yourself kind of provides a context for some of that um, conceptual um, knowledge you have and it helps to reinforce what you learned in class. But I think more than anything, it also gave me a direction because in the beginning, I wasn't really sure like what exactly I wanted to do. But after, um, after my um, time working at the Drexel University archives, like, I realized this is, I really enjoyed what I was doing there. And that's what I want to do um, once I actually start working in the field. So yeah, um, that's it. Yay, fantastic. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited. I thought you already knew you wanted to go into archives because you had a history background. I'm so glad that you figured it out. <laughs> well, we I, I knew I wanted, I, I was really interested in archival work, but I wasn't sure exactly like what I wanted to do with it. Mm -hmm. But the work I was doing there, I was having a lot of fun with it. And I think like that's what I want to do. Yay. I love a happy ending. Uh, we have a couple minutes for questions. Anybody have any questions for Stefan who got to go into the Drexel archives and play with old photos of the Drexel family? I thought that was a really cool idea. I'm kind of curious what the, the documentation levels are. So I understand the work you did, mm -hmm. but what constitutes the capstone? So do you document your daily work? Do you summarize it? Does it turn into a large report at the end? Uh, yes, throughout the um, the project, um, we would have to write like various um, various papers. Like they're they're just like reflections on um, the work we had done so far. And at the very beginning, when you're planning your project, you have to um, come up with learning objectives, success metrics, 
and um, I think it was, I forget the third one. But it's basically you had to come up with all these goals and what you want to have done by certain dates. But then when you're going through it, as you're doing your reflections, you also have to look at those um, those metrics and how how well you've done um, achieving them so far and whether you need to revise them going forward. Yes. So to start out to propose a capstone, the student works with the professor to create a set of learning outcomes, what you want to learn from the project, a success, a set of success metrics, how you're going to know at the end if you if you are successful, and project milestones, um, different things you'd like to achieve throughout that 10 week period so that you can monitor your progress as you go. And as Stefan said, um, then two additional times during the term, you write a paper reassessing your project milestones, success metrics, and learning outcomes to see if they're still on target or if they need to be revised. We got a how question. Does the, how does the press, I'm sorry, how does the professor get chosen? Do you just pick someone you like? Uh, well, there's somebody who is teaching the class and that's the person overseeing your project. But if you specifically want someone you've been working with in the past to also oversee your project, you could invite that professor as an additional supervisor. Uh, most people, however, have their supervisor, the person teaching the class, which is either me or we have an adjunct, Jennifer Sweeney, who's fantastic at teaching the course. She's teaching now with Jane. Um, so far, we're the only two who've caught the, taught the course. We, we got a chat question from Barbara who wants to ask Stefan, um, can you roughly say what percentage of your work involved working with digital items and what percent with physical pieces like the photographs and the course catalogs? Um, so my time working with the physical materials was mostly just the scanning of photos. So that was, I, I'd say about um, the first two or three weeks was mostly just scanning because I would have to take each photo out individually and place them on the scanner and then go through all that. And um, I think later on, because I worked on the photos and the, um, the course catalog separately. So there was a time later on, like it was only about two or three days where I was just scanning all the pages of the course catalog. But then after that, um, I say pretty much the entire rest of the project for uh, about like two months was um, just working with digital material, um, creating metadata, uh, doing quality control, uploading it all to the um, to the um, uh, online repository. But when I was doing the metadata, I did have to um, bring the photos back out and look at them more closely to um, like transcribe everything, um, look at the photos to see if there's anything in the photo that I can use to create, to like figure out a date or the people in the photo for the metadata. But uh, yeah, it was mostly digital work and um, the physical work was um, scanning. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I heard someone say something. Oh, what, me. What metadata standards were you using? Uh, uh, honestly, um, uh, I can't. I can't really remember because they gave me a guide, and I was basically following the guide um, on how to do everything. Cool. Like it was like telling me like use these specific things. Yeah, I'm sorry. Don't Because it, it was also like a few months ago at this point. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Stefan. All right. Next, we have Lucy, who had a very different experience. Let's hear what Lucy has to say. Hi, guys. Um, so, yeah, I started my uh, capstone project with the Digital Theological Library. So it was all remote work. Uh, I'm located here in South Dakota, and they... The person I was working with there, I think he was in California. Yeah, I think a specific time zone. Um, so that was fun, just coordinating, you know, different time zones and everything. But basically what I was doing for them um, was digitizing these uh, religious texts that they had, um, or sorry, 
these religious texts were digitized already by other repositories, academic libraries, things like that. And they were just trying to bring everything together into one database, um, the Digital Theological Library. So I was going through um, and finding these things and creating um, basically a copy cataloging into the OCLC uh, for them so that someone searching on that site could then pull up everything rather than trying to you know, go to this site, to this site, to this site. Um, and so I stood, took, stuck to that project about um, four weeks. And then I kind of realized, you know, this really isn't meaningful because um, I was working on my reflection paper, I think for uh, the midterm reflection paper, I started looking at those questions and I'm thinking, this isn't meaningful to me. So why am I doing this? And it was, it was a really hard decision to, um, I talked with Denise and be like, should I keep doing this or should I find something else? Um, and it was tough because I don't, I usually don't give up on projects and I felt really bad not fulfilling you know what I said I would do with this um, but I talked with the uh, coordinator that I was working with through there and talked with Denise and we came up with you know plans like yeah it's because the capstone is should be something that is meaningful to you and you should get something out of it then um, I decided to pursue another option um, so then what I did was I went to um, I currently work at Sioux Land Libraries in Sioux Falls. Um, we're a pretty decent sized library system. We've got uh, 13 different branches and I'm at the main downtown branch. And at the time I was an associate and I asked my supervisor, like, well, is there anything here that I can kind of help with? You know, I'm looking for something for a capstone project. Um, and at the time she was, she is the uh, adult program team lead. And she said, oh, well, I know, that um, the assistant director and the director, they're kind of working on some sort of, you know, program policy for the entire system. Um, it was kind of surprising we didn't have one. We have, you know, policies for everything else, um, collection policy, meeting room policies, but nothing for program guidelines. And so I talked with the assistant director and um, it seemed to be a good fit for me to start working on this. Um, so, and it was also really nice too that I was currently taking the, or at the time I was taking the um, programming, like library programming class, so it's called. And so it was really nice just to have that class and then creating the program policy and just it all fit in so well. Um, but what I did for my project was I started, you know, doing research on what other public libraries have for their program policies. And just kind of looking at the wording, the verbiage, and seeing, you know, what's essential, what's good to have, what's, you know, extraneous. Um, and just looked at other libraries, and we found one, oh, I forget which library it was now, that um, the director also really liked too. So I took that and kind of, you know, made it our own, kept a lot of the wording that they had. Um, and I discovered too through the process that a lot of libraries have just kind of copy and pasted from each other. And I couldn't find the original source. So it was um, really interesting. I don't know where a lot of this verbiage came from, but several libraries will have the same word for word in certain paragraphs, you know, describing um, some of their uh, like hierarchy for, you know, who's in charge of program. Like first it's the director and then um, who they give like the power to for programming. Um, and I collaborated with a lot of other programmers um, and the program team leads and some of the other managers to just get their input um, after we had a draft and I had them read through it and just, you know, had conversations with each of them. Um, like, does everything make sense? Is there anything that's concerning? Um, and we had a lot of conversations about what ifs. Um, I think for some of them, they were concerned like, well, what if, you know, a customer or a patron says, has an objection to this program or wants to suggest a program, you know, what would we do in those circumstances? So that's, and that's the main basis why we needed that program policy to begin with for our system. Um, and so I feel like I learned a lot with this project. It was really also nice because during this time I um, got promoted to librarian for, pro, uh, for teen programming. Yeah. And so um, it was good, like just, being able to work with that and then my new role and then um, 
also, like I said before, applying my direct content from that programming class. Um, like there was even, I think, a week of when we talked about um, policies and programming, and it was just so applicable. And yeah, it was really nice to be able to use that. Um, and I think for those of you looking for projects, the biggest thing is find something that's meaningful, because I didn't at first, and um, but it meant in, in the end, it turned out really well. Yeah. Yay, thank you so much. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I asked you to talk here was I thought it was really brave of you to realize as you started a project that you found that it wasn't meaningful, you weren't learning what you wanted to learn, and you switched to something else. So yay, that was fantastic. It was very brave. And also, I think because of your self-realization, you changed what could have been kind of a disaster into a meaningful program, a meaningful project that meant a lot to your community. After you wrote your program, uh, program policy, it was then presented to the library board and voted on. Yeah, um, so that was kind of fun. I got to go to the library board and um, present the policy to um, our trustees and then they voted on it. You know, well, first we read it for the one meeting and then two months later, um, they voted on it and it passed. So it's up there now. It's like, oh yeah, I did something. <laughs> yeah. It'll be director in no time, frankly. Oh, Matthew, Matthew who says that uh, he made a comment while you're talking, said finding all the, the text being reused in library program policies and other policies is like an oral tradition people keep passing on. I like yes. that. Yes, I could not find the original source and it was driving me nuts. I spent a good couple of hours trying to figure it out and I just could never find it. But Matthew, did you want to say something else? You start to say something? I did start to say something else, but now I've forgotten what that was. <laughs> but there was something else earlier I wanted to ask, which was um, the first project with the theological um, program. Did you lose your faith in God or was it the the pro the program itself? Like it, it was just menial work that yeah, they were Yeah, it was just the work. I was just taking things that already existed and just finding matching records for it. So it's just still interesting because I had like cataloging stuff, but that was just basically kind of busy work cataloging. Yeah. So. It could have been any subject matter, really. Yeah. Right. It wasn't because it was just religious. <laughs> I like how you exploded her uh, her project into a total loss of faith in God. <laughs> wow. Okay. I, I've been watching Bergman. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> so, does anybody have questions um, for Lucy? I'll have a question. <laughs> Go when you were, when you were developing your your plan, who were you developing it in conjunction with? So were did they just go, hey, come up with something, Lucy, or were you working more actively with the director or higher ups? Oh, for the program policy, yeah, yeah. Um, so I worked a lot with the assistant director. Um, she, as these for our um, system, because we have like a hundred um, some staff members the assistant director is um, kind of oversees all the programming. So she sees over, oversees the program team leads and then oversees each of their age categories. So like I have teen programming, I have another colleague who's got birth to five, another one who's K through five, and then the one who's adult. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the hierarchy of it. Um, I talked a little bit with the director, you know, when we got ready to present, because um, had her look over, look through it and correct any little things that she found so she, she likes to work with formatting a lot so she changed like the font size and <laughs> all the stuff on that <laughs> so yeah great fantastic okay next we have jane Littman, um who made some slides so i am going to share my screen again cross your fingers i can get it to work mm, this one Here we go. So here is Jane. And Jane, just tell me when you want me to advance to the next slide. Sure thing. All right. Hi. So I'm Jane, and I'm currently in week three of my capstone project. I've transferred degrees to the new MSI program, but I'm still taking the single 10 week capstone project. And since this quarter has been shortened, my capstone is actually only nine weeks. So I am a third of the way through, which is a little alarming. 
But so for my capstone project, I'm doing a cyclopedia ontology with the Metadata Research Center here at Drexel. If you can go to the next slide. There you go. So I'm working in collaboration with the Drexel University Metadata Research Center, or MRC, which is run by Professor Jane Greenberg. And so she is kind of my project advisor, whereas Jennifer Sweeney is my capstone professor. Um, then after that, there is a PhD student, Sam Gravos, who also works at MRC, and so she is kind of overseeing the more day-to-day -day functions of the capstone, and Jane's just like this higher up there boss. And then I'm working in partnership with Scott McClellan, who I believe it's his third quarter here at Drexel, and he's going to continue this project after I graduate as an MRC employee and possibly for his capstone. And we're also working kind of our end user is a faculty member over at Temple, but someone that we're also like reaching out to for this project um, because it's like a digital humanities project is Peter Logan, who is in charge of the 19th century knowledge project at Temple. And so we'll be like, hey, is this an 18th century printing convention <laughs> in this text or is there an actual hierarchy there? And so he reaches back out to us. So I got involved in this capstone really last minute because originally I was also going to do a project at the Drexel University Archives doing access accessions, but then COVID happened. And so I needed a new project because both Drexel Library and Archives are closed and all of the libraries down here at Wildwood are very closed. So there just wasn't going to be anything if I couldn't find something to do virtually. But I'd worked with Jane Greenberg previously at MRC doing a project last summer. And I'd seen her briefly in winter quarter when I was around campus for midterms. And she was like, you're doing your capstone soon. You should do a project with me. And I was like, yeah, sure. Because at the time I was like, no, I want to go to the archive. And the archive closed. And I was like, hi, Jane. Remember you said that I could do a capstone with you? <laughs> Are you still open? Is that possible? Right? which I wouldn't have done if metadata wasn't a genuine interest of mine, but as it is, I love metadata and I've already worked with MRC. And if I had done a capstone with the archives, it would have been more metadata oriented. So I decided to go work at MRC. Next slide. All right, so the projects that I'm doing is I'm part of the collaborative effort with all those fine folks we just introduced and we're creating and encoding a World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, Simple Knowledge Organization System, SCOS, Compliant Standard Ontology, for the Ephraim Chambers Cyclopedia to be uploaded into MRC's Hive tool, which that's what our fine picture is. So it has a placeholder entry here, and it says, oh, it has 2,435 terms, which is a lie. <laughs> You know, we're, we're going through now and fine tweaking and seeing how many actual terms we're actually going to upload and which ones are placeholders or which ones aren't actual terms. Um, but so if you actually clicked that link through for the Chambers Encyclopedia on the web page, it would just take you to like, oh, this is a searchable screen. But what it will take you to in the future is like this tree view of searchable terms where you can click through each and see how they're all related and what their hierarchical structure is. You know, and so when I was saying, oh, W3C SCOS, that's just standards. It's this is the standard for an ontology that we want uploaded for the web, W3C, and it's gonna be SCOS language encoding because that is the encoding that's mostly used for thesauri which is the closest equivalent to the Cyclopedia, which is a precursor to the Encyclopedia Botanica. So, next slide. So what I wanted to learn from this project, which I came up with really super quick as it was a last minute project, was when I was doing my things, was I wanna learn about ontology creation. 
you know, like, how is it that you actually make an ontology from whatever your source material is and figure out a standard for it and then encode it and then upload it somewhere so that it's all visible and functioning out there on the web. I wanted to be able to read and write in SCOS encoded RDF XML. <laughs> more standards, but basically I wanted to be able to read and write the standard that we were using for this project. And I wanted to be able to potentially be able to navigate new metadata tools or programs, which is a little in flux at the moment because again, COVID's come down and it's just like, no, you can't go to the physical MRC on campus. You can't use this software that you've already paid to be able to use on those computers. So we're, it's in the works. We're working out at the moment what we're going to do. But so far, we're about to have our third meeting for my capstone at three this afternoon. So, so far for two weeks of check-in progress. Um, I'm not sure how far I'm going to make it into the life cycle of this project, considering how short my time is here. Um, at the moment, I've been going through and we're still working out what our standards are going to be. You know, and we've been going through each item and determining if it's in a hierarchical relationship or not, but there's a lot of terms, so it's taken a little bit. Um, it turns out that software on Multitasks, which this is the program I was talking about that's on the computers back at Drexel, Multitasks will just generate your SCOS for you if you upload plain text. So you don't need to write it. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> there, there was a learning objective. That's kind of just like full blah. So uh, we'll see how it goes. If we can't have access to multitask, then we're going to have to figure out something else anyway. And if worst comes to worst, I'll end up just for my project, you know, possibly hand encoding like 25 to 50 terms I said was going to be my project outcome. And then Next slide. So what we're doing so far. So my intro slide was kind of just, it broke down the upper level knowledge organization system that they have. Um, these are like the individual term entries that we have that we're working with. So the first one is like meteorology, you know, and then the second knowledge term is hydrology. And then within that, they break it down to you know, like lower level concepts. And so what we're trying to figure out is are all of those lower level concepts equivalent or are there further hierarchies? So we, I've enclosed in red little boxes, you know, the different kind of grammatical formatting that Chambers used. The issue since it was the 18th century is that he's not very consistent in how he chooses <laughs> to format things, so you've really got to kind of go over it with a fine-tooth comb and have our standards in place for what we're going to do when we see, oh, that's a bulleted number, or oh, that's something that could be etc. Is he using it here to end something? Is he using it to break things up? Like, what's he doing? So when we rang off last week, it was the only time that we were going to consider something a hierarchy was if it had the word whence being used, which I'd caught. So once is, gosh, it's the last thing that I've boxed in in mineralogy, you know, and once means like coming from. So he's saying like, oh, blah, blah, blah. These are all our gems. And then you have lapis from which comes ultramarine and azure, which I've Googled in today. And that makes no sense to say that ultramarine and azure actually come from lapis, but hmm. So, so, so far I'm looking for instances of whence in uh, he has like 47 of these different knowledge categories and I haven't come across any others other than that first instance of whence, but we'll see how it goes. I did notice even further that he uses italics versus non-italics to uh, distinguish between natural language groupings, which I personally feel is a hierarchy, but we have to see what the rest of the groups thinks. 
because I'm over here like, this is a hierarchy. You should be organizing it like this. But teamwork, I have to be like, no, okay, for this project, for MRC, where you're doing this for natural language indexing and you want like really concise terms. Mm, okay, fine, no. So next slide. So this is what we've been working on right, right now. So we'll read through the page that we just previously saw. And then the first column here, column A, was Sam Gravis's PhD student's original text mind look at the terms for their relations. And she said that everything was a related term. You know, she put it in there just as like a placeholder term. but. Then Jane Greenberg was like, but are they all related? They might just all be related. And I wasn't gonna be like, you're a professor, but you're wrong. But I was like, oh, but some things are more related than other things. So I've put in my column that yes, everything is still a related term, but in the comments, you know, I've added how they can be further grouped that it is less work if we decide after our conversation today at three that they can actually be further broken down in a hierarchy. Um, further cut off is uh, Scott's attempt. You know, that didn't make the PowerPoint screen, but it also hasn't made my screen. So, so far, I think I'm the only one who's had a crack at it, but we'll see. Last slide. Girls, so ideally, if I learn something from this project, which I feel like I'm definitely learning at least about collaboration and sharing, and then I'll be better set up to be an ontologist or a taxonomist, as opposed to just like a more general purpose metadata librarian. And there's really cool jobs out there for that. So like the uh, art museum in Philadelphia, they wanted a taxonomist about a year ago to just like merge all of their collections in a hierarchy. So obviously that opportunity has gone away. But there's lots of really cool stuff out there that I'm really excited about and hopefully this will get me well prepared to do stuff like that. Yay, that's wonderful. Uh, certainly different than the other other projects we've seen so Very far. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have any questions to our our new taxonomist. Let's see, Barbara says, two questions. It sounds like you're doing serious content analysis. Have you had coursework or other experience to prepare you for that? And can you say more as to what you've learned about collaboration? All right, so, so I'm simultaneously taking the Applied Ontologies course here at Bechtel as an independent study, where so it both simultaneously helps and doesn't help. In regard to the capstone, it helps because I do get, you know, like the really basic level understanding of what I'm physically doing, but it doesn't help as in I'm still at the really basic stuff and we're already doing really advanced stuff. Um, with content analysis, the project that I'd previously done last summer for Jane Greenberg was I was a graduate research assistant um, and she was writing, she's writing a paper for 11 years of metadata research. I know, and at the literary review. And so what I did was I, re she had already had a previous student working this project and I took it over because the student had graduated and I used her exact same search terms. And I just looked for, yes, does this involve metadata research? Or no, does this not involve metadata research? So for content analysis, you basically have to decide for yourself what it is that you're looking for and then be thorough, you know, like the previous student was like, I'm just gonna read the first five listings. And I was like, uh, I wanna take that further. I'm gonna read every single listing and see. And so I did, I searched and I read every single listing because sometimes the upper listings, they just, with the search terms that she was using, they wouldn't be relevant and further down, you would see that there was a portable research, but so I had job experience doing something sort of similar to what I'm doing now, you know, and also trying to work out the standardization between, oh, this is what this person's done. Oh, this is how I'm going to 
while working with a faculty advisor, especially. But no, other than that, I really hadn't done any course coursework or experience. It's kind of, it's about determining aboutness, which is something that we learn about a lot in the metadata courses here at Drexel is what is this about? You know, if you have to give it a subject heading, what subject heading are you going to give it? Now um, with indexing, oh, are these most frequent terms that pop up, are they useless filler or are they actually what your piece is written about? So you kind of just read through something and determine if it's that not valid, but if it's adhering to your standard or if it's not, and if it's not, you check it. And if it does, you say, yay, a friend, and you bring it into your group. And what I've learned about collaboration, what I've learned about collaboration is that it can't just be my way, even if I've written it in my way. Collaboration is, yes, you're a well-respected authority voice in this field. You obviously have a really good opinion, and I should listen to you. You know, like I was coming, I almost did an archive project. You know, so I was coming from a very archival frame of mind and I was like, we need to adhere to original order principles, you know, like this is how Chambers wrote it and obviously we should stick to that, right? Like, because that's why we're using something from the 18th century as opposed to the current Library of Congress subject headings, which just don't accurately reflect what people from the 18th century are writing about. When they write about science, they're talking about a very different thing than when we're writing about science. You know, so like in physics, they included witchcraft. We don't include witchcraft in our definition of physics right now. So in adhering to, in going back to the original source, it was about reflecting the virtues of the time and the ideas of the time. And so I was all, oh, we really need to like reflect that in the most original way that we can, right? But then I wasn't thinking about the tool, right? I wasn't thinking about Hive. And so, and I don't have experience uploading things to Hive. So I've got to listen to people who have worked with Hive and have uploaded things and do know how the tool works to be like, yeah, well, we need to break these down into indexing terms, and indexing terms are best when they're a single term, and you can't have a phrase that's, you know, five words long, just because Chamber wrote a phrase that's five words long. Um, you know, so it's about listening, but also about, like, allowing other people to do the work. So, like, I'm a perfectionist horribly. I'm like, yes, it's all going to be done perfectly. Even I have to like get my little fingers in there. But like, no, it's okay. Other people do good work too. Like, hands off. Just do your own little column, which is a very big column. Do your column. Scott will do his column. And then we'll talk about it and we'll compare things and we'll decide on the best perspective. But great, great yeah, thing. overreach. Don't do overreach. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you so much, Jane. Let's see. Next we have Brittany. So let me bring the slides back up. You ready, Brittany? Yes, I am. And how are we doing on time? Uh, we've got, you still have a, a few minutes. Do five minutes? Yeah, okay. So hi everyone, my name is Brittany and I did my capstone project at the Manlius Public Library here in Manlius Central New York. Um, for those of you who don't know, we're about 10 minutes outside of Syracuse, which is our largest city. Um, it should be noted that I'm actually from the Bay Area in San Jose, California. So I was really surprised by the size of the Manlius Library. It was a lot smaller than what I'm used to seeing, but I'm still very impressed with what the staff was able to accomplish. And can you go to the next slide, please? So just a little bit about this library. Um, the Manlius Library serves the village of Manlius throughout Fayetteville Manlius Central School District and has over 10,000 registered patrons. It has the largest summer reading program in the county with over 1,300 students participating every summer. This library offers traditional and innovative programming services to support literacy and learning at every age. And then can you go to the next slide, please? 
So just a little bit about my internship. Um, it began on September 23rd and lasted till November 26, 2019. So just about two quarters ago, I think. Um, I went two days a week between 9 and 2 p.m. I had two supervisors, the library director, Jennifer Muff Milligan, who is actually a Drexel alumni and one of Denise's past students, and her technology manager. My job was to implement a new data structure within the Integrated Library System, or ILS. Manlius Library uses Polaris, so that was my main tool in making it easier for patrons to find materials. Um, let's see what else. The library director, Jennifer, um, she actually thought of this assignment for me. I had just randomly emailed a couple of the library directors in the area and she responded back saying that she had had a project she'd been trying to make time for, but she just didn't have the bandwidth or staff to complete it. So I really lucked out on that one. My main thing that I was hoping to learn was really the ins and outs of a non-customer service focused area. I currently work in customer service and I'm familiar through volunteering what librarians and other customer service people do to make sure that patrons get the help they, that they need. But I really wanted a more behind the scenes view of librarianship. And this project really helped me achieve that knowledge. For instance, at a different library internship, I had sort of a similar experience that Lucy had. Um, I wasn't really allowed to touch the ILS system and I can't even tell you about a program, program they used. I was more hands-on with the patrons in answering community program questions while doing marketing and social media. But here at the Manlius Library, it was sort of a completely different story. I really got to get my hands dirty and do real librarian work concerning the data structure of the collections. So I initially started in the children's or juvenile section and literally put, put all the books on carts. I scanned them into the computer and came up with either new shelf names, new shelf locations, or new collection names. The way it was currently set up in the library, um, patrons had a really hard sense of series versus nonfiction series versus fiction and where their placement was when, in, in the library when you walked into the children's section. So I worked on these new terms and keywords with the technology manager, as well as consulted other librarians to get their opinions on what might work best for the patrons. I also had to update all the keywords in Polaris for each book, then re-sticker the bindings and then put the books back into their new locations if needed. I had also started out wearing really professional business attire, but by the time my product ended, I was wearing t-shirts and jeans every day because the work was just so labor intensive that wearing business attire was becoming a little bit too uncomfortable. One thing that, I, that really surprised me was how nice everyone was at the library. I worked in marketing for almost eight years and it was just a really toxic work environment. But at the library, everyone was super relaxed. They greeted each other and generally just liked doing their jobs and helping people. I learned that I really like being in charge of the actual physical books and more of the technical side of librarianship. For the future, I think um, after COVID-19 wears off and our libraries open back up, I'm going to look for a technical library position in our area. So I think that's it. Great, fantastic, thank you. Um, let me stop sharing screen. Does anybody have any questions for Brittany? I love the idea that um, it's multiple generations of Drexel grads and students working together. That made me very happy. But does anybody have questions for Brittany who worked in tech services? I have a question, I'm kind of curious how their library was set up beforehand that, you know, so that they needed to kind of restructure, is it just the children's area that you worked on? Yeah, so I was supposed to work on more sections, um, the children's and actually the adult section as well, but I only made it through probably about a quarter of the adult section and then I finished the entire children's section. But basically we had board books, the, um, what do you call the books where it has different stages for reading literacy? Readers. Yeah, right, easy readers. Um, we had the electronic stuff, so such as the audio tapes and CDs. And then we had all of the fiction, but the fiction was also separated into different series. So some of the fiction would be alphabetized, but a parent would come in and say, well, where's the Judy Bloom series? I don't see it in the alphabetized section. So they would have to go to the series section and find the Judy Bloom series versus 
the regular fiction section. So it was just sort of confusing how everything was set up. And so we wanted to get rid of some of the different shelf locations that didn't make sense. So we got rid of all of the series and converted them over to juvenile or children's. And that, that's what really made us have to redo all of the stickering to take off of the series stickers and put back on the J. Um, so that was a little bit tedious, but it was really needed because it was very confusing why we had so many different sections and so many different collections when they could have easily been collaborated. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Last, we have Albert, who's going to tell us about life in an academic chemistry library. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I did my capstone project last quarter from January till about mid-March at the chemistry library at the University of Pennsylvania, which is also where I've been doing an internship for a little over a year now. And my supervisor came up with this idea because she told me that she has a friend in the UK at the University of Bath who was doing a similar project. And so I researched inclusion criteria of several different chemical databases to evaluate the credibility of the content, which is an example of information literacy. And some examples were PubMed, ChemExpr, ChemSpider, Novel, Merck Index Online, SciFinder, Reaxis, Combined Chemical Dictionary, and CRC Press. And I also evaluated the credibility of Wikipedia as well because a lot of students tend to look there first since they might do a Google search and Wikipedia is usually one of the first results they would see. And when I was an undergrad, I had not heard of any of these sources or even Wikipedia. And so I also had a chance to learn about these resources myself too. And then I would also look up chemical and physical properties of various compounds that were involved in an organic chemistry lab course across all the different databases plus Wikipedia and enter the data that I would find from each one in a spreadsheet. And then later on, I would look at the trends information trends across the rows, like for the same substance and property, as well as in the vertical columns for the individual resources. In general, the data were fairly consistent across the different databases. And, and for temperatures of melting and boiling points, there can be a few degrees variation because different instruments can vary in their degree of accuracy. And, uh, and then I also, when looking in the vertical columns, I looked at in general the kinds of information that are typically presented and you know one difference I found was that for solubilities there were some databases that had very quick qualitative information like the extent of solubility in certain solvents while others showed quantitative data with like numbers of moles or grams of solute per volume or mass of solvent and then I finally came up with prioritized lists of recommendations of these chemical databases for undergraduate students. And most of the students taking the lab course are pre-med students and there weren't many chemistry major students in that course. So I geared my recommendations specifically for undergrad students. And I would keep user friendliness in mind when making these recommendations. And I came up with one source as a starting point for quick information, which was the Merck Index Online. And I also came up with three of the databases to recommend as last resorts in case students still have not found what they're looking for in other sources, considering that they appeared rather cumbersome and they were novel, Reaxis, and SciFinder. And then for all the other databases, I would make prioritized lists of recommendations for looking up certain properties like solubility or melting point and boiling point or chemical properties. And I would say to use Wikipedia with caution because sometimes I saw citations of reputable sources and other times I didn't or sometimes I found citations that did not appear to be reputable sources. And in general, I'd say it's best to look up information in multiple sources to compare data. And a challenge that I found was that I felt overwhelmed at times when seeing tons of results, especially in those three databases that I had mentioned earlier, which I would recommend as last resorts, Novel, SciFinder, and Reaxis. And I may not have gone through every single compound that was 
used in the organic chemistry lab course, but I still had plenty of content to work with overall. And in the future, I hope to become a medical librarian and a chemistry library is definitely not a bad starting point for sure because many STEM related fields involve a mixture of different scientific disciplines. And in the future, I plan to keep my recommendations in mind when assisting patrons. And my supervisor and the organic chemistry lab professor also plan to use my recommendations and incorporate them in their instruction as well and make a decision tree. Another point that hasn't been mentioned yet is besides a project that you are interested in and would be meaningful to you, it also should be something that would benefit the organization where you're doing it too. And not just, yeah, not just because you have to do this project as part of the requirements to graduate. And sorry, well, that's all I have. Wonderful, great, thank you so much. Um, very different perspective working in an academic library and chemistry in particular. Does anybody have a question for Albert? I know we're running way over time. I just want to say um, a quick shout out to Albert. He, uh, we've really enjoyed having him at the Penn uh, Science Libraries and he did a great job. I don't know if there's time, but I would love to hear from Albert and if, if time the other um, students as well, how they see themselves carrying forward any of the relationships they've developed doing these projects. Excellent question. Albert, may Albert, would you like to go first? Oh, okay. Yeah, so my supervisor was very proud with my work, for sure. And uh, yeah, she definitely has been saying that I should definitely include her as a reference. And uh, yeah, and I also, yeah, so I definitely, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, so these websites I had a chance to really learn more about and I also realized that, uh, and also another thing I learned in the process is that, yeah, with, you know, with collaboration, it can involve kind of like a balance. On one hand, yeah, to keep your supervisor informed on a regular basis of what you're doing. And then also on the other hand, yeah, my supervisor would often say that it's up to me to decide my ways of doing things. And, uh, yeah, so it's the mixture of kind of like doing stuff on your own and, but even when you're working by yourself, you're ultimately contributing to the rest of the team overall. Great, uh, other ideas for how you can maintain these relationships and continue them moving forward, relationships you've made while working on your capstone projects? Well, in my case, I, um worked with you know the first the second library that I worked with was uh, where I'm currently working and so it was really nice to just be able to get to kind of work with different people because I think before that I'd maybe spoken to the assistant director like three or four times um, not I mean we're in the same building so not too much but so it's really nice just to getting to work to work with her and then now now I in my new role I work with her a lot more and so it's, it's just a good introduction to that um, so definitely, I think if you, you know, pick some place where you're physically in a certain area or even um, a certain, uh, what am I trying to say, um, a certain area in the profession too, even if it is digital, it's easy to just to kind of keep those contacts. And like you said, Albert, and just having someone as a reference, even if you afterwards, when you're going to look for a job. Yeah, so... It's really, really weird. But when I went as a prospective student to Drexel to a open house 2017, Jane Greenberg was actually there at the open house ceremony. And she was one of the first faces of Drexel that I actually saw, you know, and her attitude was kind of just like what really got me into Drexel. It was like, oh, this is like a warmest centric fun place to be, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and then I got her for Info 590, which was at the time, I don't know if it still is, was like the entry level metadata course. Like, oh, this is everything about metadata. And I was like, so hooked. I was like, this is great. She was just like, I need a student worker. And I was like, 
I'm full time now, but if you give me ne until next quarter, I'll be part time and I'll work with you. And I worked with her and it was great. And now I'm working with her again and it's great, you know? And it's like I have her cell number, which I, there's a nice little block there. I only use it if I like absolutely can't get a hold of her. I'm like, hi, you remember we had a meeting five minutes ago, right? Are, are, you, are you coming? <laughs> but are, do you see your email? You know, but so, you know, she's one of my references and definitely in the future, it's, you know, an academic friendship. I definitely continue maintaining and pursuing, you know. Great, thank you. Great. And just a little something for me. Um, I made a lot of good friends with the librarians at my library and everyone was so welcome and open and open and willing to help me with the questions that I had. Um, we, we email constantly with email threads and through Facebook. And there was sort of a running joke because there's an older librarian at the Manlius Library who I want to say is in her early 80s. Mm -hmm. And so I've been promised a job if she retires. <laughs> it's amazing that she's still working. I know. She's <laughs> very sweet, though. <laughs> Yeah, uh, for me, um, yeah, like like everyone else has said, um, the archives technician and the digital um, archive archivist who I was primarily working with, I've said I can use them as references for anything, like just as long as I give them a heads up beforehand. And um, actually, shortly after um, I finished my project, they actually like um, invited me out to like go to this. Um, this industry like function with them um it was um for the i think it was the um an archives system or a library system in like the area and um I, I got to meet a lot of archivists um through them and just kind of got to um like just um like speak to other people on like a professional level and that's been like really helpful and um yeah, and they've also because when i finished my um my project i had done like metadata for most of the photos but i didn't actually um like i didn't have the chance to upload all of it to the repository so they've actually recently um sent me an email about how they finally uploaded the rest of the work i finished so <laughs> We, we're still um, like communicating every now and then. Yeah. That's awesome. You got to go to that conference. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, we're, we are over time. But if you have more questions, please do email me anytime. Send them my way. Oh, wait. Ah, we got it. Thank you. You're welcome, Ellen. And thank you so much for joining us. Please ask us questions. And uh, so excited about new projects to come. Every project is completely different for each student. And hopefully you guys will make meaningful projects. So thank you, everybody.